On a cool Wednesday afternoon, 24-year-old Lisa Ziegert shows up on time, as always, for work at Brittany's Card and Gift Shop. That night, I had just popped into the store just to check in, just to say hi, just to catch up. We were talking about her being a teacher. Lisa was soon teaching during the day, and then she worked at Brittany's at night. And then we just did our cheerful, normal hug and kiss goodbyes, and, and I went home. The next morning, early in, in my day, I hadn't been at work very long, I got a phone call because Lisa had not shown up to work at the school, and that was highly unusual. Minutes later, Lynn's phone rings again. It's another of Lisa's worried coworkers. My friend worked at the same card and gift shop. She had come for her morning shift, and the store was found open. Lisa's car was in the parking lot, and her belongings were still on the counter. My friend knew something was not right, and that's when she called the police. None of it made any sense. I had just been there the night before. Everything seemed normal. Lynn came to my office. And I said, oh, what are you doing here? She said, Mom, Lisa's missing. She didn't just leave. She had a great rapport with kids. She was drawing. She was you know, teaching. She was happy with her boyfriend, Blair. She loved him and was convinced that, you know, someday that they would marry and have children. She was just happy with her life. The police officers who responded right at the beginning knew that something very bad had happened. Lisa's belongings were still inside the store under the counter. There were no signs of a robbery. The cash was still in the register. Today, we might check video cameras and surveillance in the area, but there uh, was no such thing at the time. But there were some signs that a struggle had occurred, especially in the, uh, the back office area. There appears to be a spot of blood on the top of the refrigerated door. Uh, they checked the alley behind. They checked businesses nearby, uh, dumpsters nearby, see if there was any type of evidence that might have been found there and they started talking to people from uh, the nearby businesses, trying to track down anyone who might have witnessed something. But investigators didn't find anything at the scene to suggest where Lisa had gone or who might have taken her. The store was crawling with policemen. The detectives asked, was she having trouble with anybody? We were unaware of anybody having any interest in harming Lisa. I kept thinking, why would anyone hurt her? She was such a good person. Why wouldn't they just let her go? <sighs> On Easter Sunday, an Aguam resident was walking behind his property. He saw in a clearing in the woods a partially naked body of a female. The Aguan police were able to immediately identify that body as belonging to Lisa Zeger. Lisa is found about a mile away from Brittany's card shop. The area was definitely off the beaten path. It was on a clearing on kind of a dirt road. Lisa had significant injuries, including uh, at least half a dozen knife wounds and there was evidence that she had been in a fight for her life. The investigation reveals, through autopsy in particular, that Lisa's also sexually assaulted. And there were multiple deposits of forensic evidence. And a lot of effort went into determining that this was a single source male DNA profile. One of the witnesses also reported to investigators that he had seen a suspicious person lurking across the street before Lisa had been taken. The guy was kind of moving back and forth in a strange way, and he described him as a relatively tall, slender man wearing a dark army-style jacket. I remember the night I went to visit her at the store the Thursday before she went missing. 
there was a customer in the store. And I remember him staying for a while. I thought it was odd that he was hovering. I remember her saying that, you know, he comes in sometimes to look at the collectibles, trying to, you know, figure out which one he wants to buy someone. So I knew that the person was somebody that she had seen in the store before. And I just remember him staying for a long time and wishing he would leave. I did tell the police about the man in the store and his description. I remember him being a tall, thin, dark-haired man. He was wearing a black jacket. Kimberly's description is a near match to the man spotted outside the gift shop the night of the murder. Investigators did look at Lisa's boyfriend. That would have been a standard procedure in any investigation uh, that had been unsolved at that point. When, when they talked to the boyfriend, he did have an alibi. Blair claims he was with his mother around the time Lisa was abducted. But detectives still take a long, hard look at him. They impounded Blair's car. They had him back and forth for questioning. They took DNA. There were no concerns about domestic violence. By all accounts, it sounded like a loving relationship. I remember Blair went out to go look for her. He didn't want to stop searching. Blair just didn't want to give up. Investigators spoke to other people who would have been with him. Uh, they were able to establish an alibi that ruled him out and later obtain a DNA profile from him that also ruled him out as a suspect. DNA technology hadn't advanced to the point where we could do some of the alternative testing methods that we can do today. So if somebody refused to provide a DNA sample, there wasn't really much that investigators could do. There is new hope the case will be solved when the state's youngest ever district attorney, Anthony Galuni, takes office. We thought that DNA phenotyping could provide some characteristics of this individual, like hair color and eye color, skin tone, that it could narrow the course of our investigation. In 2016, DA Galuni's team submits the killer's 24-year-old DNA sample for analysis. A short time later, we were provided a composite sketch of an individual. This individual was Caucasian, of European descent, had brown or hazel eyes, dark hair, moderate skin tone. We now knew that someone, for instance, with blonde hair and blue eyes was not the perpetrator. Someone who was of African-American descent or Asian descent was not the perpetrator. So we were able to eliminate a substantial number of individuals. I started looking at people who had been contacted by investigators in the past and who had refused to provide a DNA sample. We went back to these people, and just by explaining what we were doing, a good percentage of them uh, gave their DNA samples. So at the end of that process, we were able to identify 11 people, and the grand jury voted to ask the court to compel these individuals to provide that sample. Around 6.30, I got a phone call that a woman had gone into a state police barracks in Westfield and had claimed that her boyfriend authored some documents that she provided to the troopers. They were a confessional and an apology to the Ziegert family. The essence of it was, I took Lisa from her family, and I will never forgive myself. He says overtly, they're going to tell you that 25 years ago, I kidnapped, raped, and murdered a young woman, and it's all true. You know, that struck me like a ton of bricks. He wrote in the letter that he believed that what I had was a warrant for his DNA, and that was going to put him in jail for life, and that either he was going to kill himself or face the music. Troopers interview the woman whose boyfriend wrote the letters. She described him as docile. He just seemed like an average nice guy. She would never in a million years suspect would be capable of doing something like this. She tells police her boyfriend is 48-year-old Gary Shara. 
Gary Shera was one of the 11 names that we had taken before the grand jury. Gary Shera first becomes known to investigators in the context of Lisa Siegert's death in March of 1993. Gary Shera was one of dozens, if not hundreds, of men whose name had come up in a similar way. His ex-wife said that he was very interested in the case. He would always run into the room when the news came on about this case. She also said that she thought that he had purchased a music box at Britney's card shop within the days or weeks before Lisa was taken. Investigators speak to Gary Shera in 2002. He refused to provide his DNA voluntarily at that time. In 2008, investigators again speak with Gary Shera. Gary appeared to be very conscious of not providing a DNA sample, either intentionally or accidentally. He wouldn't touch the table wouldn't take water that was provided to him. He was asked to provide a DNA sample at that time, and he refused. His reasoning, he was afraid of cloning. There was certainly nothing illegal about one's refusal to provide DNA. That didn't necessarily signal something nefarious. But at the end of the day, there just wasn't enough there for them to move forward with him as a suspect at that time. We wrote a search warrant for his house. We seized a number of items that were likely to have his DNA on them. One item was his toothbrush. The toothbrush was taken to the state police crime lab. I remember very vividly awaiting the results. Myself and my lieutenant were in the office, and on my cell phone, it, it lit up Concord Mass, and that's where the lab is. We learned that the profile developed from Gary's toothbrush matched the single source male DNA profile obtained in 1992 from Lisa Ziegert's killer. Gary Sherrill was charged with aggravated kidnapping, aggravated rape, and first degree murder. Sherrill pleads not guilty. 27 years after Lisa's murder, Sherrill finally breaks his silence. Tell me then in your own words why we're here. We're here to make, change, to make a change of plea. To guilty to murder in the first degree. Do you understand that? Yes, sir, I do. Mr. Shower, the court has accepted your plea of guilty to indictment 17-600, count one, charging murder in the first degree. The court orders you to serve a term of life in prison without the possibility of parole. 